whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. Hello. Oh, I'm Lindsay. <laughs> I feel like you always like to mess with me on the name. It's always like a pause, it's like an awkward, like, is she going to say her name? Why won't you just say her name? Because <laughs> I like to see what you do. True. You know that it makes me immediately anxious. <laughs> just say her name. Just say, say her name so I can say my next thing. I know. I know. But also, I think like... Yeah. You know who I am. You're but here. It might be a new listener. I know. I know. It just feels weird to be like, hey, I'm Lindsay. Mm-hmm. To just you. Because <laughs> you know me. <laughs> and we're back. And we're back. Welcome to the show. Uh-huh. Glad to be recording new episodes. Uh, thanks to everyone for the awesome feedback from the 100th episode. Now that we're... Uh, now, this is the first one we've recorded since that one came out for us, and the feedback was so fun, and yeah, yeah we're glad that people had a good time with the drinking game, and yeah, it was uh, our most downloaded episode, and that feels good. Minimal complaints about the ice clinking. <laughs> right. I'm sure there's, yeah, we knew there was going to be yeah. some. Sorry about that. I, yeah. I love one message. They were like, well, maybe have a drink without ice. I'm like, do you drink warm vodka? <laughs> I don't think we can be friends. <laughs> But we're no, no ice today. No, no ice, ice, baby. couple quick announcements, and then we're off. Uh, very cool Sacred Arrow Annabelle exclusive tea in the store at badmagicmerch.com. You can check it out, Annabelle's. Thank you for, for your support. Yeah, just use your little code from Patreon to get in there and get it. Sweet. Uh, and speaking of support, thanks to the Annabelles and Roberts on Patreon for helping us donate $15,000 to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. And you can go to wffoundation.org to learn more about this great cause. That's so many dollars. Mm-hmm. Good amazing. job, guys. Thank you. Uh, how many stories do you have? You have two, right? I don't. Oh, you have one story today. I have one massive, giant story in Pakistan. Oh, that's very cool. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. It is big story day because I, I have two big stories. Oh, well, look at you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, first one is, is uh, set in what is arguably Scotland's most haunted graveyard, mm. Greyfriars Kirkyard. Um, Harry Potter fans may know about this one, like diehard fans. I'm laughing because Monroe did her 23 and Me, and it came back with like this yeah. preposterous amount of Scottish. She loves talking about being Scottish. Because it irritates Kyler. He's like, you're not Scottish. The results aren't correct. They can't be correct. There's no way that you're that Scottish. Like, he just loses his ever-loving mind about yeah. it. So she constantly is like, oh, yeah, I got to go to the homeland. Oh, Scott. Like, just every way that she can bring it up. Everything so is I- Scottish with her now. Oh, my gosh. She's just going to start eating Scottish eggs. Like, oh, it's so great. It, it is. It is funny, like how just uh, the genes express themselves differently. It's mm-hmm. like why siblings can look so different. Yeah, and you know, like um, if uh, it's like a half Irish, half African family, like one kid could look way more Irish than the other kids, or one kid could right. look way more African. And I find it interesting with the Twenty Three and Me. I think it just shows how the genes express themselves so differently. Where yeah, for whatever reason, Monroe had more Scottish kick in. Oh my gosh, <laughs> than you, Kyler. I think you need to have a scientific conversation with our son because he is convinced now mm-hmm. that Twenty Three and Me is a farce. It doesn't work. Oh. It's not real. He's he's. Tr- Truly angry. He's like, it's not possible. He's like that. It's Monroe. It's literally not scientifically possible. He's he has gone, lost his mind. He's gone into conspiracy lore. I guess so. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll have to do some research now. Okay. So anyway, yeah. First one set in Scotland's uh, most haunted graveyard, Greyfriars Kirkyard. Uh, I'll be telling this tale of the Mackenzie Poltergeist. Uh, apparently, a very active and hostile entity. Who? Then we'll leave Scotland and head to locations unknown. Uh, the place is never revealed in a very strange story with cult vibes about a young woman who thinks her new job is too good to be true. And then, of course, finds out that it is too good to be true. Oh, man. Anytime anything feels too good to be true, it is. Yeah, she ignores a lot of red flags to oh, her to her detriment. Oh, no. Is she a Darren? Mm, no, not necessarily. Kind of. But it, you'll see. It's It's tricky. She has incentive to keep going. All right. We'll see what kind of mood I'm in, if I'm, like, forgiving or if I just think she's a Darren. Yeah, it's a coin toss. Okay, okay. Uh, are you ready for the first tale? I am, but first, without showing everyone my hoo-ha, because I'm wearing a little skirty skirt today, mm-hmm. I'm just going to do this. But these socks are so great. I love them so much. Let's see if you can read them. If you can read this, I can't see it. Uh, send more crystals. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's perfect for you. I love I love these. <laughs> uh, 
we we get awesome stuff in the mail from our fans, and yeah. sometimes people drop stuff by. And unfortunately, there was no name on the the gift that arrived, so I don't know who to thank. But <laughs> these awesome. are possibly my new favorite socks. I'm gonna wear these ones a lot. <laughs> uh, Greyfriars Kirkyard is a graveyard next to an old prison in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, long had the reputation of being one of the most haunted places in the UK. The graveyard hasn't changed much since the 16th century. It looks like where you'd film some scenes or film some scenes. Some kind of old, beautiful black and white movie. Huge, ornate family tombs with smaller headstones scattered throughout, memorializing the bodies of the dead that have been added and added since 1561. Uh, not, not really added recently, but for many, many years. Bodies were stacked on bodies so many times over the centuries that now when there's a lot of rain and the ground is soft, sometimes bones come up. Ew! Pushed up, pushed up by the tree roots. That is not real. I, that's what uh, one of the caretakers for the cemetery said on a, on a YouTube video I watched that was pretty recent. That sometimes, yeah, like remains, old remains, because they just uh, they just kept burying people on top of people in these family tombs. Oh, uh, I don't think or I family want, plots. For one second, I wanted to go. Now I don't. No, thank you. <laughs> Well, you'll see pictures. It's very, very uh, a, a pretty cemetery. Okay. Uh, a mix of spooky and beautiful that has a certain charm to many. Numerous famous authors in the years past have said or are said to have visited and sat amongst the hefty graves and tombs looking for creative inspiration that possibly comes in the form of contact with whatever lies beyond. Scrooge, the character made famous by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, got his name thanks to Dickens misreading a name on one of the headstones here. It actually says Scroggy. <laughs> Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, said to have often sat in Greyfriars during the day while writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Cool. Bram Stoker, said to have visited seeking inspiration while working on Dracula. J.K. Rowling, who wrote, who wrote the Harry Potter series, began working on the, the first book in that series at a small cafe very near the cemetery. And many of her fans think that she got a lot of names for a lot of the characters in the book from the headstones. Oh, yeah. Because it's a lot of the same names between the uh, cemetery and her characters. Uh, did these authors feel something here? Some energy that comes from the restless dead. Did they come hoping to see a ghost? Many can't, I think they came hoping to see the ghost of Sir George Mackenzie. Uh, this ghost is the most infamous of several entities alleged to haunt the grounds and is thought to be responsible for a lot of poltergeist activity at Greyfriars Kirkyard. And, and Kirkyard basically just means churchyard like a church graveyard. Oh, I'd Kirk, never, K-I-R-K? Like, mm-hmm. I'd hmm. never seen that before, but it's just, it's just a term for uh, a Scottish church graveyard. Huh. Does it make you think of Kirkland's? Like the Costco yeah, brand? A little bit. Makes me think of Kirk Cameron randomly. I don't know why he's popping in my head. Okay. Uh, hundreds of witnesses have claimed to see who they believe to be the spirit of Sir Mackenzie over the centuries. Sir Mackenzie was born in Dundee in 1636, uh, one of Scotland's bigger cities. He was educated at King's College in Aberdeen, where he was amongst the top students. Went on to write many acclaimed law textbooks for the time and challenged what he felt was an ignorant persecution of witches. Also gained notoriety as one of the best and most ruthless prosecutors in the country who achieved the title of Lord Advocate for King Charles II, basically the chief legal advocate for the Scottish government. He got a lot of blood on his hands while holding that position. In 1679, Mackenzie imprisoned 1,200 Covenanter, Coven, Covenanters, it's kind of a weird word, a religious group opposed to King Charles in a field next to Greyfriars Kirkyard. And there, several were executed. Hundreds died of maltreatment. His treatment of these people earned him the nickname of Bloody Mackenzie. Mm. When he passed away in 1691, his remains were laid to rest in what has become uh, a family mausoleum, a huge, big, black, gothic-looking structure that would, uh, by the time of our story, hold countless remains belonging to his future relations. His restless soul is believed to haunt the grounds, along with the souls of many he had put to death, directly or indirectly. Time now for the tale of the ghost of Bloody Mackenzie. One cold, rainy night in December of 1998, a homeless man looking for a dry place to sleep on a rainy night ended up in the Greyfriars Cemetery. The gates to Greyfriars were usually closed at night, but this particular evening, the BBC had been filming a documentary and the gates had been left open. The man entered the graveyard thinking he might be able to find some shelter. And he would find it. He just wouldn't stay very long. As he walked towards the back of the cemetery, just next to the old prison, he happened upon the black mausoleum of the Mackenzie family. Unlike the other tombs that had large iron gates, the black mausoleum had solid wooden doors, which meant the man thought that it would be much drier and possibly warmer inside. Unfortunately, he discovered that the doors were locked with a large iron padlock, so he didn't think he would be getting in anytime soon. He peered through a small gap in the doors one last time before moving on to look somewhere else for shelter, and something caught his eye. A small white light floating around in the dark that brought with it 
that brought with it a compulsion to get inside the tomb. Walking around the outer edge, he spotted a small rectangular gap at the very back, which luckily he found he could barely fit through. Within a couple of minutes, he found himself standing inside the mausoleum. That small white light was now nowhere to be found. He took out his lighter, which was all he had on him to see by, and found himself standing in a circular room made of stone with a cold black floor. It spooked him, but at least it was dry. He then was about to put his lighter back in his pocket, lay down on the stone floor to fall asleep when he noticed a small iron grill in the floor. Peering through the gaps, he could just make out some stairs. Further down, he thought it must be even warmer. He'd now pretty much forgotten all about the white orb that had led him in. He thought about how if anyone came around to patrol the grounds, as they often did, and happened to peep inside this tomb, they wouldn't see him if he could make it down those stairs. He thought it would be perfect. So he tugged at the grill, felt it loosen quite easily. He took a couple of pulls to shake some of the rust off around the edges, soon managed to open it, set it aside, and then he started to descend down the stairs. It wasn't a long staircase, but it was steep, and in the dark he lost his balance. Tripping over something, most likely himself, he tumbled down onto yet another stone floor. It felt as though there was some soil scattered about to, uh, the stone on this floor, and his feet could make out some bumps where the stone should have been, but it was something else. Pulling out his lighter again, he looked around and found himself staring at a line of four extremely large and very ornate-looking coffins. He'd never seen such things. The fact that anyone could afford to bury someone in such a thing astounded him. He figured that each of the coffins was worth more than his parents' house. A thought now crossed the man's mind, one he wasn't proud of, but he justified it to himself as something anyone would do if they were down on their luck as he was. It occurred to him that if the outside of the coffin was that fancy, whatever the dead had requested to be buried with would probably fetch him a pretty penny. Looking closer at the coffins, he found the one belonging to Sir George Mackenzie and figured this one would be his best bet to find something valuable. He picked up an old piece of wood from a pile he had next to the stairs, started to hit the seal of the coffin with it as hard as he could. While this was happening underneath the tomb, a man named Rob was taking his dog for a nightly stroll around the old graveyard near the tomb. It was a little later than usual. He'd already wished he'd taken another route. The place was creepy in the day. In the dark, it was a whole new level of frightening. He just started to try and encourage the dog to turn around so they could head back home when he heard an almighty bang from inside the large old tomb. The noise understandably unnerved Rob, who held his flashlight through a gap in the wooden doors, trying to get a look inside, muttering to himself about how stupid he was for even looking. The dog didn't like the noises coming from inside either and hid behind Rob's legs. Back inside the tomb, the homeless man had just given the coffin one last whack with the wood when the lid flew open and he was knocked to the ground. Once he got over the initial pain, he tried to right himself a little and found himself face to face with an eyeless skull. A corpse now lay on top of him. Flustered and scared, he turned a little on the ground in an attempt to get up and found himself greeted by another eyeless face. Once on his feet, he fished out his trusty lighter again and took a look around himself and realized that the bumps he'd felt beneath his feet were bones. <gasps> he climbed down into a literal mass grave. And now the glowing orb was back. Surrounding it, the dark, shadowy shape of a man he would later come to believe was the ghost of Sir George Mackenzie. All thoughts of being warm and dry for the night left him. He struggled to get himself back to the iron grill as fast as he could, and then the frightened man frightened another man. Rob and his dog, above, now watched a scruffy, human-like shape seemingly come up through the ground inside the tomb. Oh, oh my God. Rob couldn't believe his eyes, and when he saw the scruffy, human-like shape coming up through the ground, he felt a wave of fear engross him. Uh, as he saw what he, what he thought was a literal zombie, an undead corpse, climbing through a hole at the back of a mausoleum. He ran screaming out of the graveyard, his dog following with its tail between his legs, and he would never come back. But he would tell a local news station about what he'd seen. And that story would make it to Ben Scott, and it would change the course of his life. Ben Scott was a tour guide. He took people on ghost tours at night around the older parts of Edinburgh. When he heard the traumatized dog walkers interview on the local news, he saw pound signs flash before his eyes. His tour attendance had been light recently, maybe now that would change. Within a week, he'd propose an idea to the city for a new ghost tour to the old Greyfriar Cemetery ending inside the old, supposedly haunted, zombie-infested Mackenzie Mausoleum, and he got permission to do it. Not long after starting his ghost tour, which was just as successful as he'd hoped, he also got a great deal on some cheap rent for one of the properties at the edge of Greyfriars and moved into his new home. Despite his vocation, at this point, Ben does not actually believe in ghosts. He did believe in making money off of those who did. And not in some sleazy way, he didn't see anything unethical at all about a non-believer playing on the beliefs of the paranormally faithful if everyone was happy. 
The people he took on his tours enjoyed themselves, they wanted to be scared, and Ben knew how to scare them. It was a win-win. The first few weeks of Ben's tours did nothing to change his status as a non-believer. But then about three weeks in, his customers began to report more and more paranormal activity. First, a woman fell hard onto the ground near the mausoleum, was adamant she hadn't slipped. She said that a freezing cold blast of air had somehow pushed her to the ground. She would be the first of so many to make similar claims. Over the next two years, allegedly, 24 people were knocked unconscious by something they couldn't see while on Ben's tours. They passed out. Many more claimed to have been attacked. People started showing him cuts and bruises and scratches. I'll show some pictures at the end, actually. They claimed to acquire while walking around with Ben. Some found themselves overcome by nausea. Some encountered cold spots, strange smells, heard disturbing banging noises. They saw orbs and shadowy figures, especially in and around the mausoleum. Still, despite experiencing the cold spots, strange smells, and banging noises himself, Ben refused to believe. He still thought that the ghosts were nothing more than a psychological manifestation. He was just getting caught up in the hysteria of it all himself, nothing more than that. His opinion would soon change. Sometime in late 1999, members of the local press invited a minister, Reverend Colin Grant, to go along with Ben to the McKenzie family tomb to check things out, give his opinion for a local news show regarding the validity of hundreds of recent claims of paranormal activity. Ben found the whole thing comical and was sure the news station had told the Reverend to basically ham things up and be as dramatic as possible and he thought Colin was all too happy to oblige them. Colin entered the tomb, immediately started staggering, holding his head, looking as if he was in terrible pain. Then he clutched the wall and pulled himself back out. The whole thing was over in a matter of minutes, and the quote given to the, many TV, sta or to the TV station was, there are many spirits in pain there, many, something else as well, something much stronger. Ben thought the minister had played the whole thing up for TV. And then on November 14th, 1999, Colin Grant was invited back to exercise the area. Ben watched it play out on TV. As far as exorcisms go, he thought it seemed rather dull and most definitely just for show. He watched as Colin took a dozen candles into the Mackenzie tomb, placed them in a circle around him, lit them, and started saying some prayers. The whole exorcism took only approximately 10 minutes, and there was no screams or noises. Colin didn't get covered in scratches, his head didn't spin around, no one flew through the air or even got vomited on. And then Colin exited the tomb and declared the area to be free from harmful spirits. But he also stated the ritual had taken a lot out of him, which Ben found odd. Even odder, he predicted that the experience would quite possibly lead to his demise. And then just two, two months later, the seemingly healthy Colin Grant literally dropped dead, collapsed and died. Despite the reverend's claim that he had exercised the tomb, the paranormal activity never stopped. In fact, reports went up after the exorcism. He'd banished nothing. He did possibly anger whatever was already inside. All this macabre publicity was great for Ben's ghost tour business, but bad for his actual life. It was getting harder and harder to remain a non-believer. The paranormal activity seemed to not only increase in the tomb, but also expand to the surrounding neighborhood where Ben lived. And I'll show pictures again. It's very close to the houses. Within a few weeks of the Reverend's death, Ben's neighbors started to make claims of poltergeists uh, in their homes, three houses, excluding Ben's, were apparently affected. Residents reported seeing a glowing orb, a shadowy man, cold spots, menacing banging and scratching sounds. A few even claimed to be uh, attacked by an unseen force. Gail Baird, who lived in one of the houses bordering the graveyard directly next to Ben's, claims to have started witnessing all sorts of paranormal activity. She said she watched her shower door open and slam shut by itself. Her clocks began behaving erratically. They'd stop randomly, or more disturbing, the numbers would start cycling around the clock at rapid speed. One day, when she returned from shopping, she found that all her stuffed animals had been arranged into a pyramid on her bed. On another occasion, she came home to find all of her pictures that once hung on the wall, now all laying on the floor. She also couldn't shake the feeling that something was often near her in the home, watching her. Then Ben finally had his own paranormal experience, a powerful and memorable one. One day, just several weeks after Pastor Colin's death, Ben came home from work, walked into his living room, and saw what looked like blood dripping down his walls, and a small glowing orb between him and the blood, the spirit of Sir Mackenzie. He froze, trying to process what he was seeing, and then he left to visit his parents. His religious parents insisted that Ben leave the house at once, offering for him to come stay with them, but Ben refused. He didn't want to be scared out of his home, and he gave the wall that still looked stained in blood a fresh coat of paint. He convinced himself it was just rust or something, possibly water damage. But then Ben started having a terrible recurring nightmare. 
In his dream, he would climb on top of what seemed to be the Mackenzie Mausoleum, where he could see across the graveyard in the moonlight. It would just be dark and silent at first, but then he'd hear a groan coming from near the gates. He'd glance over and see what at first he thought was a human, but as it came closer, he noted it was extraordinarily thin and spindly and must be at least eight feet tall. The creature would see Ben, fix its deeply recessed black eyes on him, and would come for him. And then shortly after it would touch him in his dream, he'd wake up. And then where it touched him in his dream, his skin would have large, angry red welts. Now his clock started to inexplicably stop or speed up all the time. Just like his neighbor Gail's clocks had, objects began to disappear and reappear somewhere else. Finally, starting to feel quite a bit frazzled from being tormented, after a bit more than uh, uh, usual to drink one night, fired up on liquid courage, he decided to go out and confront the spirit he thought was tormenting him. Oh boy. He walked nearby to the Mackenzie tomb, yelled into the darkness, demanding to know if the spirit was real. He unlocked and opened the doors, was about to enter the tomb when a blast of freezing cold air knocked him off his feet and onto the ground. In front of him, he saw the shadowy form of what he believed to be the ghost of Sir Mackenzie. He felt the biggest wave of fear he'd ever felt, fear that made itself known in his bones in the pit of his stomach. He crawled backwards, begged the spirit to leave him alone, and ran back to his house. And the spirit did not seem to leave him alone. A few nights later, Ben's house burned to the ground. <gasps> The buildings on either side were not affected, and the fire department could never determine the origin of the fire. Luckily for Ben, he wasn't home. His home would be rebuilt, but he'd never live there again. A firm believer in the paranormal, and now a firm believer that sometimes it shouldn't be messed with, he abandoned his Grey Fires ghost tour. He actually soon put a lot of distance between himself and that tomb, about the most one can. He not only left Edinburgh, he left Europe, traveled to the other side of the world, and started a new life in New Zealand. Wow! He'd had it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I kind of appreciate that. Yeah, he, right? he like, definitely yep. got the fuck out. He massively got the fuck out. Which, you know, I can't say I blame him. Mm-hmm. Wow. That is so weird. So I have some pictures. Okay. Uh, this first one is the Mackenzie Mausoleum at Greyfriars Kirkyard. That so it's just that black, black thing in mm -hmm, the back. In the back. And you can see... That right behind it, I think that's the old prison, but now I think it's, uh, you know, basically apartments, condos. Oh, okay. There's just a bunch of people who live, like, right up next to this, uh, what's left of this cemetery. Could you do it? Could you live mm, there? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. You're uh, living alone. Uh, this this next one is uh, scratch marks on a man who claimed to have been attacked by oh my the McKenzie God. poltergeist. Yeah, like, pretty pretty bad scratch marks. Yeah, that's aggressive. And there, and there, okay, that's not what I was expecting. And, wow. And there's a lot of these kind of pictures. I'll just show one more. This is a little uh, compilation of bruises, scratches, uh, a broken toe claimed by others to have been caused by the poltergeist. And uh, what? on this one ghost tour website, there's a whole bunch of these pictures. I just, I mean, and these would happen while they were on the tour. That's what they claimed. Yeah, just a lot of injuries, people losing consciousness. Uh, this next one is a picture of part of the cemetery showing just how it butts up right next to the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. It's like their front yard. Mm hmm And there's like a little park, you know, path, you know, going through it. Mm hmm And then uh, this next one is some gothic carvings on a monument in this kirkyard or graveyard kirkyard. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Kind of spooky. And then one more, just a cool little part of another monument. One of those uh, little angels or Mother Mary in there. Is is that what it is? I think so. Mm-hmm. Looks awfully creepy. Mm-hmm. But Okay. Okay. Very ornate old tombs. Yeah, yeah. I know. It is impressive work. Uh-huh. Anything else? That's it. Yeah. That's a weird story. Okay. That A lot of activity. Yeah, that part where the homeless guy is crawling out. I know. How crazy that would be to see that. I mean, I, th I thought it was funny that, like... It is hilarious. Uh, a supposed encounter with, a, with an apparition led to definitely not an encounter for this other person with an apparition, but it looked like such an intense experience. Like, you're just walking through this little uh, graveyard at night with your dog, and then you hear something, go to inspect it, and you see what oh looks God. like a zombie crawl up, to, <laughs> crawl up to the ground. That might be worse than seeing an apparition. Right, like, right. Like, the thought of a zombie coming for you. <laughs> right. Because, because I, I would assume that you could tell the density of what's coming towards you, right? Where like a ghost, oh, yeah. you know, it, mm -hmm. you know, it has like a very minimal opacity, you know, it would yeah. feel light, I think is the word that I want. Yeah, and I think in this cemetery, because it is surrounded by um, all all these homes, yeah. I'm sure it gets like enough light mm -hmm. where it's never totally dark here. Right, right, right. Yeah. And and I would assume that... Which make it creepier in that in this sense. 
Right, because you can really see what you're seeing. Yeah, you're like, oh, that's definitely a solid figure coming out of the ground. That's right. It's not my a figment of my imagination. I am seeing yeah. a human-esque thing. It's lit up just enough to make it worse. Wow. Yeah, and I bet in that area as well, there are probably frequently other people actually also taking their dogs to, yeah. you know, use the bathroom or, you know, just going for a very late night stroll. So it's probably not uncommon. So just that combination of like, you know, you could see an actual living, breathing yeah, human. Yeah. But then the fact that this thing came up out of the ground. Right. My God. Oh, oh. my God. And then I just realized these little dolls made uh, to look like us are here. Uh, I don't have, I didn't even realize they were going to be in here on the, uh, on the desk. Oh, I just put them in here because they're so cute. They're so cool. And I, so I don't have the fan's name in front of me. I know we thanked him on socials, but these things are amazing. Are like these, these, can I have my doll? Yeah. These, um, what would you say? Quilted? No. Crocheted? crocheted? Good job. Okay. Yeah. These crochet dolls. Oh gosh, one to look so like cute. me, one to look like Lindsay. And whoever made these nailed it. And again, we said, we, we, uh, and I, I know. And she posted them on her socials and I commented. Okay. Oh, so cute. Yeah, and, and we already posted on our socials, I believe, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, yes. cool. Just to make sure. For the fourth time, yes. Well, no, sorry. I I mean, to be fair to me here, I do a fair amount of podcasts, and they all have different socials, and I have a hard time keeping track of what's going on with what. I'm just laughing because you kept saying, I think we post them. I was like, uh-huh. Oh, I think okay. we post them. Uh-huh. Look, I even have a little crystal. <laughs> I, have a, I have a little slice of amethyst. Uh, I know that's so cool. And I have a little squishy. And I have little, um, you have fuzzy socks. Fuzzy socks. It's, little, it's so cool. They're so cute. I know. I love them. <laughs> and I love that it's updated with my brown hair. Uh huh. Yeah, it's awesome. So cute. Can you put her back? Yeah. Be gentle with her. Okay. She's I a will. delicate flower. She really is. She really is. <laughs> are you Are you ready to leave Scotland? And... Wait, I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm not. Okay. Um, the King's College. Yeah, there's, there's there's a couple of different King's Colleges. Okay, that was my there's question. There's one in London. The the most known one is in London. Yeah. And there's also, uh, I think it's still there, but there historically was one in Aberdeen. And then there was another one at one point that I think is actually still around too. I, I can't remember if they're all three around. I remember looking into them and making mm -hmm. sure that the one in Aberdeen fit the, you know, I had to do a little further research. Because I was like, oh, did he go to school in London? Yeah. And the one in London, if I'm remembering right, wasn't founded in time for him to have gone to it. And then I found this guy, this Mackenzie guy's kind of like, you know, biography, if yeah. you will. And it said that he went to the one in Aberdeen. And then I verified that that one was open in the 16th century. I'm with you. Kyler has talked about King's College. Yeah. The one in London now is a very prestigious university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we got a smart kid on our hands, <laughs> for better or worse. And then I just had one other question. When you were talking about the exorcism, was this exorcism done on live television? That's what it sounds like, that's according what, to the sources. Okay, that's what I took but, away. And I thought, like, that is, that would, I can't imagine mm -hmm. that happening. But exercise in a place, you know, sometimes they use that word a little bit differently. No, I know what it means. Yeah, but... yeah. So it's not like um, there was some person like, rah. No, no, I didn't think that there would yeah. be, but it's still... I, I actually can't imagine that in a, an American television. It has happened. Uh, it has? I don't have the names at my fingertips here, but just talking to our researchers and just, you know, doing, we have our little meetings or whatever. Yeah. And there there have been actual, um, I think it was in the 80s, and I can't remember what it was on, almost like a Geraldo Rivera type show. Oh, I see. Where, you know, like in those type shows, there, there have been some uh, filmed exorcisms. But live. But live. Yeah. Yeah, like on live TV. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, then. Well, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> that would be, that would be, wow. Well, if any TV uh, executives are listening right now, man, you want to bump your ratings. There's a live exorcism. Can I'm, you... I'm surprised there hasn't been a reality show now that you bring that up. Yeah. That just follows an exorcist. Right. I mean, it would be very controversial. Because there, there, so many things are. Who cares anymore? Oh, uh, true, true. But uh, yeah, it would be especially, which would actually be good for the show because it would help get ratings. Exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. what they care about, right? I mean, true. that's what they're going for. God, because I'm you surprised. Because you would have the the very religious people who see this as like a sacred thing mm -hmm. that it's not appropriate to be showing this. Saturday nights at ten on A and E, The Exorcist. Oh my God. Oh yeah. But if it went with the, or if it went like the one that they did on this live show. Where nothing happened, <laughs> yeah, that no. would be a problem. But you're like, okay, okay, three seasons in, you're like, God damn it, oh, something's gonna happen, right? <laughs> American TV though, American reality TV, something would happen, whether it was real or not, would be very debatable. But the, but the producers would make certain that something happened. Oh no, you just burst everybody's beliefs that reality TV is real. <laughs> what? Does anybody still believe that? I yes. <laughs> uh, are you ready to leave Scotland now? 
yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm ready. Uh, we can head uh, to what feels like somewhere here in the States mm -hmm. for a mysterious and disturbing tale that makes me think of the, uh, and you'll see why when we get to it, the climactic scene from the movie Seven, which I just actually watched again. Oh, that's why you were listening to it. Mm -hmm. What's in the box? What's in the box? Uh, yeah, I watched that movie on a plane recently, and I was like, yeah, holds up. I know. It is such a great movie. And if you haven't seen it, it's just such a bummer because anytime someone says what's in the box, there is always someone in the room who's like, what's in, what's the, in the box? box? What's in the box? Oh, God, what's in the box? Oh, my God. You should win an Oscar for that performance. <laughs> That's early young Brad Pitt. I know. Do people often tell you that you are young Brad Pitt? Mm hmm Wow. When I, when I do that. I, I could see it. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't. <laughs> uh, looking forward to seeing what you think of this one. Uh, not much setup at all for this one. You ready? Oh, I was born ready, baby. Whoever posted this claims they recreated this story from fragments they'd found posted by someone claiming to be Jenna's roommate. The roommate claims to have witnessed Jenna change from a great, well-adjusted young woman to something terrifying after she went through some sort of metamorphosis and joined what seems to be some kind of cult. The roommate claimed they moved away, chose not to ever speak to Jenna again, not long after the story's conclusion. Hmm. Time now for the tale of, if it's too good to be true. Aiden was Jenna's cousin. Kind of. Second cousin once removed, or third cousin, or something like that. And really successful at... Something. No one seemed to know exactly what. She'd never met him before all this. And her mom, who had known him a bit growing up, didn't seem to know exactly what he did either. Only that whatever he did made him a lot of money. Looking at online pictures on her phone, he didn't seem that much older than Jenna. Maybe 10 years? But according to her mom, he was about twice her age. He might not even be her cousin at all. Jenna wasn't sure exactly how they were related. If they were related. There was an aunt somewhere, maybe a blood relation, maybe not. It was all pretty confusing. Her mom had three siblings and her mom's mom was one of eight. And with remarriages and relocations, it was hard to keep track of everyone. Plus, now the family members of Jenna's generation had started getting married and remarried, adding to more confusion. Jenna's mom had heard from her aunt that Aiden was back in town after a few years of living abroad and needed something like a personal assistant. And Jenna really needed some extra money. After Jenna had unexpectedly needed to replace her car's transmission a couple weeks ago, she'd opened her bank account to discover that money had now gotten dangerously tight even tighter than it already was as a recent college graduate with tons of student loan debt to pay back. Things had gotten rough enough that a few times recently she'd been laid on rent. Her roommate Mara had kindly fronted her the money, but she felt terrible for taking it. Jenna hated being a burden on Mara, who had her own loans and other bills to worry about. Eventually, Jenna asked to borrow some money from her mother, who then told her about Aiden. At first, Jenna was skeptical about the premise of working as a personal assistant for anyone especially some guy she'd never met, relative or not. But looking at a picture her mom showed her, Aiden did seem like a nice, normal guy. And her mom said she'd heard Aiden would pay really well, certainly better than Jenna's barista job, which barely paid enough to cover her rent, let alone rent and the cost of replacing her car's transmission and paying Mara back. So sitting at her kitchen table while she listened to Mara working out along with some video in the living room, Jenna pressed the number her mother had forwarded her and clicked new message. Hey, this is Jenna. We're related somehow, lol. My mom said you were looking for someone, a personal uh, a personal assistant job, and I thought I'd reach out. Let me know if you're still looking for someone and I can send along my resume and CV. Within a few minutes, she got a reply. Definitely still looking and no need to send along a CV or resume. Can you do something for me today? Wow, that was fast. Jenna blinked and frowned at the message. The urgency of it and the vagueness of something made her feel a little uneasy. She wondered if maybe he wasn't making his money in the most legal of ways. Was he some kind of smuggler? Drug dealer, maybe? She couldn't get in trouble if she was just talking to him, right? If he asked her to do anything shady, she would just say no. Don't worry yourself out of a really good opportunity, she thought. And it was her mom recommending this guy, not some sketchy friend of a friend or something. For the rest of the day, Jenna and Aiden traded a few messages back and forth. Aiden explained he'd founded a tech startup, some kind of back-end transaction software something. She actually had no idea what he was talking about when he went into some of the specifics. And she told him about the recent, uh, you know, her recently graduating college, working at the coffee shop, being responsible, blah, blah, blah. Then mid-afternoon, mid he asked, what's your Venmo? She was so confused. He hadn't even really told her what the job was yet. Intrigued, she replied with her username. And within a few minutes, a notification popped up on her phone. She'd just gotten a payment for $500. The message attached said, that's an advance for this week. Hopefully you're serious about this. What the hell? Did this happen in real life? She could block him right now and she'd still have made $500 with just a few messages. 
She wrote him a quick message, smiling down at her phone. Sounds great. Let me know what you need. Then, as she was about to leave the coffee shop at four, he replied, Can you deliver a letter for me today? A letter? What was this, the 20th century? Who was this guy? Why couldn't he email it or mail it himself if it was so important? Whatever, not her money, she thought, and she flashed on that $500 advance. She said yes. Over the next few weeks, she did a couple more random tasks for him. He paid $500 a week for her to do things that took no more than four or five hours tops any given week. Grab a letter, pick up a package from his post office box, stop by so-and-so's office, pick up a package there, drop it off somewhere else. Lots of messenger type stuff. She wondered why anyone would pay $500 a week for a few tasks like this, sometimes just one task. She felt so uneasy about it all. It felt too good to be true, but it was true. She'd already completely paid off her mechanics bill and now paying her overdue rent was the next step. Finally, after about a month, Aiden asked her to head to his house and he texted her some very specific instructions. I'm not home right now, but there's an envelope in the mailbox with the key in it. You can put the package on the counter. Please remember this for this trip and for all future trips to the house. You have to make sure that all the windows are locked. Then another message, just a few seconds later. I'm serious, all the windows, make sure. Paranoid much, she thought. She assumed he was just worried about being robbed. As she drove to his house, Jenna wondered again if she'd gotten herself wrapped up in some kind of illegal business. All these letters and packages. She looked at the package now in her passenger seat, square, wrapped in an unsuspicious brown paper about the size of a laptop, but a little bit thicker. She was so curious about what might be inside it. What had been inside the others? She thought just for a second about trying to gently unwrap part of it and then just rewrap it. Now that's probably a quick way to get fired. Pretty soon, her curiosity still driving her crazy, she was pulling up to his house, his huge house. There were stone pillars on the massive front porch and the grass out front on the large lawn looked freshly cut. A Greek revival mansion? Wasn't that what the style, style was called? He'd never mentioned any family. Was he living in this huge house all alone? Who the hell was this guy, really? Jenna found the key in the envelope, went inside. She thought about what Aiden said, about making sure all the windows were locked. It seemed a little bit of overkill for her to check all of them. She strongly assumed, based on how often he asked about them, that he had already probably made sure they were locked. But then when she started to look around at the window, she felt a weird sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach, and suddenly it seemed like either a great idea or a terrible idea to make sure they were all locked. It was the weirdest feeling. She wondered, and she didn't know why she thought this, why it popped into her head. Was she making sure that the windows were all locked to keep something from getting in or to keep something from getting out? Once she'd verified that all the windows were indeed shut and locked, that feeling in her stomach thankfully went away. What had she had been so what had she been so worried about? As Jenna had walked to the house checking windows, she also admired its furnishings. Everything looked incredibly expensive. She counted three fireplaces and an equal number of chandeliers. She thought she'd probably be able to pay off her entire student loan debt with just one of those chandeliers. Now her window check and house tour complete, she put the package down on the counter like Aiden had instructed. But when she went to put it down, it slipped out of her hands, and when she made a grab for it, she tore off a portion of the brown wrapping paper. She peered down at it, suddenly overcome again with curiosity. For protection from demonic entities, she read on a piece of old uh, wood she could now see. Use this box to trap. That was as far as she could read. Now she was really curious. It was so hard not to tear off the rest of the wrapping paper. The sinking feeling had returned to the pit of her stomach. What the fuck? Demonic entities? Was Aiden trying to trap them in this box? Were there other boxes that she'd been ferrying about? Some sort of demonic traps as well? She laughed with disbelief to relieve some tension, but it didn't work. The sound echoed eerily in the empty house, giving her the chills. Maybe it was a gag gift, she thought. It had to be a gag gift, right? Jenna tried to put the urge to tear open the box firmly out of her mind. She was here to do a job, not to pry. And who cares if he was into demons? Okay, maybe she would care about him being into demons. Why would he be into demons? It was so hard to keep her thoughts from racing around all over the place. She tried to fix the packaging as best she could and then left immediately. As she walked across the lawn to her car, something caught her eye from one of the windows. Movement? She couldn't be sure. She wondered about the locks now. Were all of them locked? Why was that so important? Now she had the chills again. That box had really weirded her out. She quickly finished walking the rest of the way to her car and drove off, happy to be putting some distance between her and her cousin's gigantic house. No wonder he could pay $500 a week for a few errands. He was clearly loaded. Jenna went to the house a few more times after that, always bringing some sort of package, always remembering to make sure the windows were locked. The next packages varied in size. Unfortunately, none of the wrapping paper tore again. Not even one time when she kinda sorta dropped it on purpose. Also to her great dismay, the last two times she went to Aiden's house, 
the windows were not all locked. One time a window on the ground floor was shut and unlocked. Another time a window on the second floor was unlocked and slightly ajar. She texted Aiden about that one and he texted back, Really? Are you sure? When she texted that she was sure, who would make that up? He texted back something that made her want to quit right then and there. He texted, That's really interesting. Just make sure the window is locked before you leave and you should be fine. Should? I should be fine? Jenna thought. She wanted to text him back. What would she say? What the fuck do you mean I should be fine, Aiden? Of course she didn't do that. She just kept trying to ignore the weird bad feeling in her stomach the house always gave her. She always felt like things were moving around in the shadows. And then she left. She couldn't wait until she got uh, a better day job someday and didn't have to do weird shit like this for money. But the money was so good. Soon what felt like no time at all, she'd made over $5,000. Enough to pay Mara back on all the rent she'd not paid. Also enough to be able to eat something other than rice and tuna. She'd think later, uh, when she looked back at this time, that this is when she should have quit. She could have got out while she had the chance. But she couldn't have known what was to come. The prospect of also paying off some of her student loans was too good to pass up when Aiden now asked her not to just drop something off, but actually stay at his house overnight while he was still out of town. Everything in her body told her not to do this. He didn't have any pets that needed sitting. It looked like the house was usually totally empty. It had been empty for a while, so why did he want her there now? It's just one night. The message from Aiden read, and I'll pay you $2,000. $2,000 for one night? The next text he sent gave her, gave uh, her a decent reason, at least, for staying there. He wrote, someone's coming by with the package, and I need you to be there when it shows up. She wanted to call her mom and ask about Aiden, but she hadn't got, her mom hadn't gotten back to her uh, recent text that she just sent a few hours ago. She must be busy. Jenna, to her later regret, agreed to stay the night. When she pulled up to his house, the driveway was empty, like it had been every time before, but now the porch light was on. Weird. And one of the windows in the kitchen was definitely unlocked. It was wide open. Jenna quickly entered the house, went and shut the window, locked it, and wondered what she'd do with herself for the next few hours. Not a great start to the night. The bad feeling in her stomach stronger than ever. She wanted to go back home. She started to leave, actually, but then her phone lit up with a notifi notification from Venmo. $3,000. A thousand more than Aiden had promised. He texted her, a little bonus. You're really helping me out. Someone will be stopping by soon with that package. Jenna sat at the dining room table, scrolled around on social media, wondered why this person couldn't just leave it on the porch or send it to the P.O. box. What was so important, Aiden felt like paying her $3,000 to be there to pick it up. And why hadn't her mom gotten back to her? Soon, it was a few minutes before 10, no one had showed up with the package yet. She brought some of her stuff upstairs and put it in the guest room. She put her toiletries in the guest bathroom, and then, in the mirror above the sink, she thought she saw some movement out in the hall behind her. This fucking house, she thought. She thought she saw something move by the door to her room. She turned around, walked out of the bathroom, got the worst feeling when she approached the guest room door. Her skin was crawling. The door was slightly ajar, just like when she'd walked down to the bathroom, so nothing could have snuck inside it, could it? Bang! 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 Someone was at the front door, the package. Jenna hurried down the stairs to answer it. She raced over, opened the door, only to find no one there. Uh. But when she looked down, there was a package. She reached down and picked it up, a rectangular shape wrapped in brown paper again, felt like it could be another box. One of those demon boxes, she thought. The thought seemingly floated into her mind on its own. Her name was on the package. For Jenna. Oh, God. Her, her heart was now pounding as she scanned the area, looking around the front of the house, looking for whoever had dropped the box off. How could they have left so fast? She carried the package inside, set it on the dining room table. She felt like she shouldn't open it. She should leave. But how could she not open the box? She tore open the paper. Inside was a strange wooden box, kind of like a jewelry box with a big lid on top. It looked very old. A bunch of strange symbols carved into the wood. A key was taped to the lid along with the note. Make sure all the windows are locked before opening. What the fuck? This was all so strange. Jenna felt almost dizzy. She didn't want to check the windows. That was crazy. How could it possibly matter whether or not they were open? But she checked them anyway. All shut. All locked. She was getting really spooked now. As she wandered around the house, she kept feeling like she could almost see something moving in her peripheral vision. She felt like something was watching her. When she shut, when she checked the windows to make sure that they were locked, she had saved the guest room for last. She was sure she'd run into something in there when she walked in. She didn't, but she could feel something. Something in the room with her. Above her, maybe. She refused to look up at the ceiling and check. 
Finally, she returned to the dining room table after bolting out of that room, and she grabbed the key. What could possibly be inside this box? She had to find out. When she moved the key towards the lock, the air suddenly felt charged. She paused right before she stuck the key in. This was a terrible idea. She knew this was really, really a terrible idea. You know how we all have that little voice inside of us telling us not to do this or that? Her voice was screaming, do not open the box. But she pushed forward anyway. She stuck the key in and turned. When the latch unlocked, the box suddenly felt like it was vibrating, humming with the powerful energy of whatever was inside. But the lid remained closed. With trembling fingers, Jenna lifted the lid up, and once it was about halfway open, it quickly finished opening itself. The box threw its lid open, and then a great darkness poured forth from it. A black, pulsating mist shot upwards towards the ceiling like a stream of rushing black water, water that looked like it was made out of a million dark insects. The undulating, oozing darkness spread across the ceiling like a thick tar as Jenna wide-eyed backed away from the box. She watched hypnotized as the room around her filled with shadowy figures of different shapes and sizes. Some came from inside the box, others came from various places in the house, like the guest room. She didn't know how she knew that, but she knew it. Almost all moved towards the windows, moving towards them as if they wanted to get out, turning around when they couldn't, looking for something, now looking for her. The windows, it was never about locking anything out. It was all always about something being locked in. That's the last thought Jenna remembered having before being woken up the following morning in the guest bedroom bed. Her mom was lightly shaking her. Aiden was standing behind her mom in the doorway. How do you feel, baby? Her mom asked. What happened? What was in the box? She almost screamed at Aiden. A new you, he calmly said. You did good, baby. It's okay, her mom said. What did that mean? Jenna didn't like the way either one of them were looking at her. Jenna now noticed a small tattoo on Aiden's forearm. It was a small dark circle with a dozen equally crooked spokes shooting out that all ran into another circle that enclosed everything. She recognized it because her mom had the exact same tattoo on her wrist, had had it for as long as she could remember. Later, her roommate will realize this image is the Black Sun, an occult Nazi symbol that became popular with certain satanic cults. What was in the box? She asked Aiden again. I told you, a new you, he repeated. What the fuck does that mean? Jenna asked. You'll see, baby. You'll see, said her mom before telling her, just get some rest. And then she and Aiden left the room. Jenna, once they were gone, quickly popped out of bed, put on her shoes. She snuck out the house. They didn't see her, ran to her car. On her way out, she noticed that all the windows were now wide open. She somehow knew this was bad. She didn't know why exactly, but this was bad. Her eyes were filled with tears. She didn't know who to call, who to tell. It would all sound so fucking crazy. She was afraid of Aiden. She was afraid of her mom now. She went home, walked into her room, Mara was home, and she told Mara everything before locking herself in her bedroom, where the feeling of being watched returned, and something was above her again. She felt sick. She wanted to scream for Mara, but no sound would come out of her mouth. She was literally shaking. She was so scared. The voice inside her again was screaming, do not look up, do not look up, anything but look up. And once again, she didn't listen. Trembling, she slowly tilted her head towards the ceiling, and what she saw above her broke her mind and Jenna was no more. She saw herself, a twisted, dark version of herself, like a mirrored image if the mirror somehow rotted your reflection. And then this other dropped down and entered her. <gasps> a new you. Jenna slept again, and she never woke up, not really. The other woke up inside of her. The other calmly left her apartment later, told Mara she was driving to meet her mother and Aiden at his big house. She was now part of something new, something powerful. She was now no longer afraid of the darkness. She was the darkness. What the fuck? <laughs> that is not where I thought we were going. <laughs> That's a crazy story. <laughs> what? I, oh, okay. I said like weird story with cult vibes. Well, yeah, very culty. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, do you have pictures? I don't have pictures. No pictures accompanied yeah. like the postings that were you know like found of the story. But like, uh, I just tried to find something. Uh, I found a, a wooden tarot box, and I pictured the box Jenna supposedly opened looking something similar to this. Uh, I was thinking like a Dybbuk box. Yeah, I, I yeah. kept thinking of Dybbuk boxes, but that was never mentioned explicitly. And then, and well, then... I don't think it needed to be mentioned explicitly. Oh, okay. Because a okay. Dybbuk box holds a spirit. True. Doesn't it? True. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. It's usually like you know a key. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. That's you, true. You keep it under lock and key so that the spirits don't get out. So, I mean. Yeah. Huh. Like somebody was like, yeah. You know yes. what it makes me think? What? Aichiwawa. <laughs> and then this next picture, is the, this is that black sun image. And but this, that's what I was going to ask you. If you. Oh, okay. I didn't know what that. 
And yeah, it comes from Nazi occultism, and uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I guess I can see the. Well, and it, yeah, and, and then it just became like popular with like kind of like little fringy cults after the war that had like satanic overtones. So sat- satanists that are also Nazis. Well, it was more like kind of like the opposite. Like um, some of the some of the Nazis, there were some weird cults within the Third Reich uh-huh. that were very into like the possibility of dark powers hmm. and very into like trying to summon demons. And summon, you know, entities that they thought would help them. Interesting. What a what a weird combination. Mm-hmm. I'm a Nazi and I... An occultist. Yeah. yeah. I want to summon a demon to mm-hmm. what? Cleanse the earth? Yeah. Just so to, I don't have to do it myself, you fucking lunatics? Just to make them more powerful. Like they really, that's a real historical thing. I, I think I would like to stop there on that. Yeah. It just like hurts me in yeah. a variety of ways to think yeah. about that. Um, and. I'm fascinated as to why we never learned what Aiden's success story is. Mm-hmm. Where's all that money coming from? Right, and all the the exchanging of the boxes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is creepy. Mm-hmm. I like the thing Three, I, Sorry, $3,000. Right. Uh, also, Jenna, why didn't you have a friend come with you? That's what I, I, oh, I kept thinking. Like, I didn't think of that, yeah. Well, if you're going to house it, I mean, I've house sat a hundred million times, right. right? Because when you're like a young and I mean, even when I wasn't that young, I was, you know, if I had a friend that was like, sure. hey, I'll pay you a couple hundred bucks to stay at my house. Like, yeah, yeah, easy money. All I have to do is pack my backpack and come over, right? Right. So why did she go alone? And there was no like, you can't. True. I mean, maybe there was, but it didn't sound no, like there it. No, was, there was nothing in the story about like, you can't bring anyone. Who knows? There's no way if somebody asked me to house it in a house that I found to be like particularly creepy mm-hmm. and I was being paid a ton of money and I had to lock all the windows, I'd be like, hey, friend, <laughs> right. you're coming with me. I need the money, but I'm not doing this solo. Yeah, yeah. Or just like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe she was, a fr- I was going to say like, I kept thinking like, why, why wouldn't you press and ask more questions? Like, what, what's the deal with the windows or what's this? But maybe you're worried about losing the money. Well, I just think about like, we don't let Joe ask too many questions. <laughs> So keep the window. we keep the windows closed here. We do, in fact. Because yeah. Because you know. Maybe that's why we're keeping the windows closed here in the in the studio. Well, Joe's not allowed to ask, so <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that when you're when you're younger, I think you're less apt to push back because yeah, you, that's you true. are finding, that's true. Right, you're finding your way in the world. You don't want to be fired uh-huh. for a variety of reasons. Yes, you need the money, but also you need like the resume building. You have different kind of debt, you know, uh, I mean, for me, it was like, I couldn't afford to get fired because not only could I financially not afford it, I didn't have a, a family that I could be like, Hey, yeah. lost my job today. Yeah. Can you, uh, help pay rent? My mom would be like, here's 50 bucks. Like she couldn't help me. Yeah. I, I did think about that. I guess like earlier on in life, like, like you have bosses or like, Hey, just do this or you just do this. Do and it. you're just like, okay. And you know, even if I thought it was like really stupid or like, that's weird. Yeah. But I'm like, all right. That's what you call your friends from the car for. You're like, oh my God, guess what my boss told me to do today. Right. I had a boss. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had a crazy boss. Yeah, you had a couple crazy bosses. Uh-huh. I had one in particular who would have me go to her house in the middle of the day uh-huh. where her poor dog was, I mean, old and dying. She should have just put the dog down. It would have yeah, been so much sad, more humane. Yeah. But she had a a puppy play, pe- or not a, uh, like a toddler's like playpen kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the dog was in there because the dog was blind and she didn't want the dog running around the house all day, bumping into things, hurting itself, possibly sure. going up and falling downstairs. And the dog couldn't control its bowels. So I would so have, to have to go clean it up, go clean it up and then make its food, which she cooked its own food. So then I would have to like get it, take its medicine, mash the medicine into it and then spoon feed the dog. And you were not her personal assistant, right? Nope. This is a well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of production. Yeah, this is what happens. This is what they do. They just, they just basically make you a personal assistant, mm-hmm. and it's not. You were a production assistant, supposed to be working for on the show. Oh, and, and I was and, working on the and show. You were, mm-hmm. and you were, but that and that, and she just abused that. She's like, hey, while well, when you're going so, here on your yeah. way, can you stop here? Here's the code to my house. Oh my but god! But then acted like she was doing me a favor, and then acted like we were friends, and mm-hmm. then it got really, really weird because at some point, my longtime best friend also worked for this person and she knew she was crazy, but it's like, you are desperate for the work and right. You have to like make it work. But then the crazy person asked my friend to make her a painting of her dog after the, yeah, because you know, we're talking about, yeah, yeah, she's an awesome painter. And, and then she wanted to pay her like 
two hundred dollars. Like what? It was just so weird. Like an insulting amount for like commissioning mm-hmm. a painting. Like, uh-huh. hey, I, 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 I'm your boss, and so I'm gonna be mad if you say mm-hmm. no, and I want you to do this painting, and I'm gonna give you two hundred dollars. Uh huh. Which wasn't even enough to cover the cost of the supplies. Right, like the canvas and the supplies, uh-huh. like. Oh boy! Man, productions oh a w- boy! I, I know there are crazy bad bosses everywhere, but yeah. there are a particular amount of them in production. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. The comedy club world, especially when I was coming up doing like crappier gigs, yeah, had you know, I mean, technically, I had a new boss every week, like whatever club I was working at, and some, some would they them, have you do weird things? Just some of them, just really crazy, mm. like just like like wildly. Craig Glazer. Oh name? my God! Yes, I mean that's actually if you want to like yeah, Craig. I forgot about Craig. He yeah, passed away. This Kansas City guy at this club he used to work at. Yeah, notoriously crazy. And especially if you put this in the context of any other job, like at a normal job, if you had if your boss was pressuring you to go to the strip club, do a bunch of blow, and then <laughs> hang out at his hot tub so he could try and get laid with a stripper. Oh, Bad Magic Productions. <laughs> you get it. Yes, yeah. Yesterday. Th- that boss would probably generally get in a fair amount of trouble. Or if that boss was fist fighting in the lobby of the business with the boss's brother and not controlling the work environment that you had to work in, that might be a bad boss. Oh my God. Or, or if that bad boss was going on stage in front of you, which made it awkward for you to say something and saying really horrible things to the audience. And thinking that they were funny. Oh, boy. Like like things that if it was a famous person saying them, you know, cancer culture would absolutely annihilate them. And maybe rightfully so. Yeah, with the things he was saying. Uh, and just the most the w- most ridiculous conversations. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I remember early in our relationship when you went out there and like he had gotten a new convertible or something. I just remembered mm-hmm. always being worried about you. <laughs> Like always worried. I didn't care if you did drugs. I didn't care huh? if you went to the strip club. I was genuinely so concerned for your safety. I was genuinely concerned about my safety sometimes. Oh. Uh, but he's a legend him. in like you know any. He's a legend in the sense in, that everybody's like, oh <laughs> Everybody boy. Everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> my God. My God. All right. Well, that was fun. That was a yeah. fun digression. Would you like to hear one one giant story? I would. Okay. I think it's I think it's quite incredible. What are you looking at? Also, this we have so many cool things. I know when we were out of town for a few weeks, and then this spider that for the YouTube viewers also. I know it's a, it's amazing work. Whoever made that? Look at it. It's, it says the show on it. This, this scared cra- to death. Crazy black widow looking. Uh, what's also, it made out of? Uh, it's wire Jewels? and bead. A oh, wire and bead. Yeah. Also, do you remember those like scalp scratcher things? Mm-hmm. Reminds you that? I, yeah, I just wanted to like <laughs> scratch my scalp with my spider. Perfect. Yeah. The whole time I was looking, I was like, I bet that would feel so good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anywho's. Um, okay. So one really, oh, you're checking out a new Squishies. I don't know who this guy is, but he's cute. I think he's Fruit Ninja. <laughs> okay. Do you know that game? Nope. I've never played it, but it pops up like, I think your mom plays it. Funny. he's a, This is my little Fruit Ninja. I think so. Because he right. has the little like knife in his pocket like, and he's going to chop watermelons. Yeah, he does. He might have something in his, yeah, in his hand. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, if it's not, it is now. Um, Okay. Now, you'll notice in this story that the Mm -hmm. fan who's recounting this story, clearly, in my opinion, English is either a second language or they speak multiple languages because some of of the translation is a little like, oh, wait, what? So just let it go. Sure. You know, English is... An inherently hard language. I, yeah, I, I speak one language barely, and, and English <laughs> and English is very tricky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to Pakistan. Okay. Which I think is, uh, I was trying to think, I don't think we've been there, right? We've had some stories of the jinn, but I don't know if they were specifically in Pakistan. Uh, well, we had that, and then we had some, um, some military tales was from the Pakistan? Middle East, and I thought one was from Afghanistan, looking back. Right. I don't think Pakistan. I don't think it was Pakistan. I, I feel like... Something Kazakhstan, something Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan. Thank you. I don't know, but we're we're gonna go visit Stan. Okay. Um, and have you ever heard of the cave city of Baluchistan? No. Okay. This, I googled it. I couldn't find like a good enough image to really. It's one of those things where like the city's name is Baluchistan. The the place that we're going to is called right. the cave city of Baluchistan. Oh, interesting. It's outside of like another little. It, it's. Like an attraction, but okay. I mean, now it's an attraction, right? But yeah. I get the vibe. I didn't want to dig too deep because I was like, I don't want to ruin my own story. Yeah. And I didn't want to like dig into like the lore and the legend. I'll do it later, okay. which is kind of how I like to navigate these. But when I was Googling it to learn how to say it properly and to get an image, I couldn't find a great picture, but yeah. you know, because they're so small. But it is cool. It's like layer, like labyrinthy, layer, layer, layer. It looks like mud and, um, you know, like water, mud, sort of like adobe kind of feeling. Uh-huh. 
but like cave, 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 cool. layer, cave, cave, cave. Cool or or terrifying. Yeah. Which it's about to be pretty terrifying. Okay. So, all right. So that is the setup. And uh, I highly recommend Googling this because it's really cool. You ready, spaghetti? I'm ready, spaghetti. Okay, let's do it. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. My name is Ahmed and I'm from Pakistan. What I'm about to tell you is a true life event and it has changed my life entirely. Though many may not believe in the supernatural, the ones who experience, however, will try to avoid mentioning it just like I do. This is a childhood trauma for my brother, my younger brother and I, that we won't ever forget. We just can't. I don't expect anyone to believe what I've gone through, only I know the truth myself and that is enough. I discovered your podcast about a year or so a year or so ago, and it feels like a safe space where the unexplainable is at the very least discussed with respect. I love how optimistic you guys are about sharing what normally is ignored and for giving a platform to people who experience the supernatural and putting in the amazing work you do. I hope this reaches you, and even if it doesn't, I'm happy anyways. I like Ahmed. I know. Mm-hmm. Oh, that just, you know, um, what's that show? Oh, you didn't watch it with me in the kids' community. Never mind. The names of people have been changed, but everything, including cities and that damned place, are all authentic, as is my fear of that entity. About five years ago, we were on a family trip. My dad loves travel, so he arranged the whole thing. Our final spot was an archaeological site, the cave city of Baluchistan, known for its mythical and mystical history. We reached our last checkpoint, Las Bella. We stayed at the house of my dad's friend, Mohammed. We arrived late, and so he offered us dinner. After that, while having some tea, my dad said, So, Mohammed, where is the cave city actually located? Mohammed's facial features suddenly became strict. He placed the cup on the table and said, Don't wait for the dark. The the earlier, the better. That place is doomed, and you have young children with you, so be careful. Oh, come on. You are better than this, my friend, my dad said, brushing off the warning. The next day, we woke up early. Just as we were about to get into the car that had come for us, Mohammed gave a final warning. Be careful, t- be careful, children. What a weirdo, my brother said as Mohammed was waving goodbye. About a mile later, we saw some clay buildings as well as a few people and camels. Oh, those must be the tribal people, our driver said. Yeah, pull over there, my father said. There was a steep, narrow, bumpy road, and we stopped by a small house. To our surprise, there was already a car there along with a couple, their young son, and a dog. My dad stepped out and knocked at the door. Moments later, a man opened the door and asked, How may I help you? We just want to stay for a few hours. I was wondering if we could be paying guests. It's okay. Guests are a blessing. He invited us in with a smile as his dark, circled eyes became a bit shorter. It turned out that he was a camel man. He had a family years ago, but his wife and child died due to some unknown disease. He now lived there with his older mother. There was something off about this man, about the village. He seemed confused in a weird way. I could feel it. He insisted that we should stay there until the next day. Later that day, I took my flash camera along with my brother to go outside. We saw the same from be- boy from before. Hello, I said. What is your name? Imran. Would you be our friend? My brother asked. Definitely, Imran (laughs) stated, and he stared at the camera around my neck. The time flew by just as the sun was setting, and an elderly man came out to yell at us. Get inside, children. Get lost now. We left silently. I was so upset I couldn't eat dinner properly. Later that night, my brother stopped as he was playing a video game. Have you noticed? What? We didn't see any children in the village. These guys are jerks, I said. They probably don't allow kids to go outside, just like that man earlier. Probably, but still weird. I was very tired, and so I went to sleep. That night, I had the strangest dream. I was hung upside down in the dark. Suddenly, something like a bear, but with patches of fur, revealed itself. I tried to move, but couldn't. I seemed to be bound tight with invisible ropes. I felt helpless. It came right in front of me and pulled out a humanoid claw, then forced it down my throat. Blood gushed through my nose. I felt it grinding my inside with its fists. With the last of my power, I looked and saw that it was wearing a skinned face. I woke up freaking out. I woke my dad and younger brother. My dad asking, is everything okay? Uh, yeah, it was, I guess it was just a nightmare. I could barely breathe. It's nearly dawn, my son. Please try to sleep again. It's okay. And for God's sake, read less horrors before you sleep. 
My brother was clearly annoyed, but I knew it wasn't anything I'd read before. Its face started revolving around my eyes, but somehow I managed to sleep again. My dad broke in and day broke in and I was hungry as I didn't eat dinner well the night before. I stuffed myself and then we walked outside to see the beautiful village. While venturing through the village, we met the other family we had seen earlier. Their dog, however, was missing. Upon my asking, Imran's mother said, oh, poor thing, the leash was accidentally tied loose and she went missing. Imran's face was sad and gloomy. Is she going to be okay, mom? Yes, honey, we will find her soon. Later, our host appeared from the corner of the house. He greeted everyone with a smile and said, We would like to show you our apple gardens. Oh, but but we're planning to head for the cave city, Imran's father said gently. No, you can go there tomorrow. It's not even that far. Cave city is only a half a mile away. You can go there anytime early in the morning. Apparently, the gardens were up on the mountains and it was quite a hike. Well, we have children with us and they may get tired, Imran's father proposed. It's okay, you can leave them at the house with my mother and we will return in two hours or so. Okay, as long as she takes care of them, Imran's mom said while smiling. Don't even worry, our host said. Our parents left and we were left with the old grandma. She sat with us, talked to us about the schools and the cities, and then she said she was going to lie down and that we should keep an eye on the door. Soon, we were left alone. Imran seemed very upset, and I wanted to cheer him up. Hey, how about taking a quick venture across the village? We could come across someone who might have seen your dog, Poppy. Yes, yes, we should, please. Although our parents restricted us to the house, the thought of exploration was very refreshing. I took my flash camera, and we sneaked through the house. I said, okay, but we won't go too far. While venturing near the boundary, we saw the same elderly man from yesterday. He might get mad at us, I thought. Let's go back, I said. Inram stopped suddenly. Wait, do you hear that? No, what? I asked. It's my dog, Poppy. I can hear her. She is not lost. She is near here somewhere. He started walking outside the village fence. It's not a good idea to go out there. Just wait, my brother said. Please, I swear she needs help. He started walking towards the nearby hills. We both started following him. And as we were climbing down the other side of the hill, we saw a dead camel. The skull was empty with a swollen, rotten rotten body. Mm. We gagged at the sight. There was a sharp turn at the edge of a brown cliff, and Imran disappeared on the other side. When we turned, we saw him standing and gazing in the darkness of a ground cave. The cave city. We watched, we reached Imran. This time, we all heard Poppy. It was as if someone were playing with her inside the cave. Her voice echoed from every cave opening. And you didn't believe me, Imran said with a tearful voice. She is here. I knew she was alive. Something was very odd and strange, though. How did she manage to come this far and take refuge in those dark caves? I was having goosebumps at the thought of going in. My gut was telling me not to go in, but then I knew we couldn't just leave the dog stuck inside. I turned on the flashlight. I'm going in. Both of you stay together. No, you don't go alone, my brother said. I will go with you. These caves seem to be connected somehow, and one could get lost. Will you come? I asked Imran. No, he said. I'm afraid of the dark. You should go back and tell someone where we're going, my brother suggested. I will not go until you bring Poppy back out. Okay, well, we're going now, but we won't be long. The temperature became colder and colder as we followed the distant barks of Poppy. Even for a cave, it was far too cold for the month of July. Where is that dog? My brother said, annoyed. The tiny flashlight of my camera provided a small beam of light against the dark, chilling atmosphere of the cave city. The small barks became clearer as we approached a hallway. I smelled an offensively pungent odor, like something rotting mixed with the smell of trash. As we reached the entrance of the echoing cave, I saw strange marks on the walls. I nearly gagged as the smell grew stronger. While we were two or three meters away, Poppy's bark grew louder, And then suddenly they stopped. I stepped in and I saw Poppy's headless body shivering Mm. and stretching. And near it was someone or something. It's back to us devouring something. I froze with horror as I moved my flashlight up to a nearly bald head with strands of sticky hair. It was utterly naked. I could see its spine jutting out. The torso was like a human female, a deceased one with frail and bent legs resembling a kangaroo. It slowly turned its head. Not knowing what to do, we stood completely still. Our logical brains were processing what kind of animal this could be. It held Poppy's head in its jaws, then gave a loud shriek and dropped the empty skull, only to disappear into one of the other caves. Run! 
My brother shook me from the trance and we started running in a panic and lost our way. We were stuck inside those damned caves with that animal or whatever it was. It was going to find us soon, I thought, my head starting to feel dizzy. This is it. This is how I die. Stumbling through the dark, we came across a less darker channel. Tiny bits of daylight somehow allowed us to hide near a huge stone. I embraced my brother and told him to stay quiet. I said every prayer I knew and quietly begged the Lord to protect us with my dry lips and needling throat. The shrieking and movement sounds continued, and because the caves were all connected, we couldn't figure out where the echoes were coming from. It was getting hard to breathe, and the faces of my mom and dad came up in my eyes. It must be a nightmare, I sobbed. But after a while, the echoes stopped. I knew it was waiting for us to come out. I wondered where Imran was. I begged God for his safety. He was our only hope. I will be alive and keep my brother safe, I promised. Against all the odds, I tried to reject the clouds of darkness surrounding my thoughts. And then, just then, I remembered the story of the dark princess. There were bones, crushed human skulls, animal skulls, rotten bodies on the cave floors. But all the bodies and bones were small. Could they have been the village's children? Mm. Tears started rolling down my face. I heard something coming closer and closer. It sounded like someone was injured and dragging their leg behind them or someone crawling on hands and knees. Could it be possible that someone has come to help us? And just then, from a cave at the right side of the tunnel came two small hands, then a head. It stayed in that position for a while, and just as I was about to call out, I saw that the eyes were closed. His hands were not moving on their own, and then I registered the face. Imran. I covered my mouth as I was about to scream, and then his body slowly moved a bit to the side. His elbows were pierced by sharp claws, and his neck was strictly adjusted by the grip of fangs in his spine. There was no point in thinking that he was alive. The creature was clever, imitating Imran like a puppeteer. I waited to see if we were... I waited to see if there were tears... Sorry, I waited to see if we were there while tears of anger flushed down my throat. It dragged its, his corpse, looking cautiously around the caves, then penetrated its fangs into Imran's skull. Crack. The thing began eating the boy's brain. My younger brother gagged and the monster stopped and looked up at us while semi-solid matter dropped from its jaws and circled around Imran's corpse. I knew. It knew we were there. And after a while, it stopped and started to act like if it didn't know, but I was smart enough. The thing was playing a game with us. I stood up and screamed at the top of my lungs while turning the flash of my camera on. My brother sat speechless, not believing what I was doing. The creature seemed surprised, but got up and slowly started walking towards me. I picked up a big bone lying nearby. I'm not afraid of you, I screamed. Though my body was nearly vibrating, I shouted at the monster. I was... It was walking on its back limbs and was very clear in our flashlight. Nearly six feet tall, it had strands of long, sticky hair patched on its bald skull. Gray eyes with black fluid running down, black outline jaws, distorted cheekbones, scaly, grayish skin with a long neck. It stood hmm. right in front of me and touched the side of my face with its cold claw. Then it slowly backed down in a way as if it was dancing back into the cave and simply disappeared. I fell on my knees, shaking and gasping for air, realizing I had been holding onto it. Is it gone? My brother cried. No, I think it wants to play with us. What are you saying to me? Get us out of here. I want to see our mom. The rules are simple, I said. If we fear it, we die. Listen, we will walk through this together. Stay firm, brother. My voice cracked. Keep it together or we will both die. I picked up a huge thigh bone and gave my brother a sharp, broken rib bone. As we walked out of the second cave, it was already sitting in a higher cave, swinging the body of Imran, brain matter dripping right above the cave where we had to enter. We walked right through the entrance, and just as we crossed that tunnel, we threw up. We have to keep moving. It kept swinging from cave to cave, waiting for us to give up. It was getting angrier as we walked by without paying it any attention. At last, we could see light at the end of a tunnel, but still, there was one cave in between us and getting out. The sniffing and snarling grew louder as we walked nearer. Then it jumped out and stood, clenching its molars, blocking our path. I decided I should go first, just in case I died. My brother would be cautious and might manage to get out alive. Gathering the last of my strength, I walked closer. My feet were heavy like iron. It was hissing like a snake with its jaws wide open. I could smell blood on its breath. I felt that it could rip me apart at any second. I pushed it aside and continued walking until I reached the end of the cave. I was shaking like a leaf. While my brother was passing, the creature took one of its hands and spoke, You should be mine. The monster sunk its teeth into my brother's arm and he started screaming with pain. I rushed back and struck it 
and struck its head with the thigh bone I'd been carrying around, knocking it to the ground with a squeal. I grabbed my brother's hand and we ran towards the end of the tunnel. It tried to follow us, but we had already jumped into the dying daylight. We fell down, and even if we had injuries, we didn't feel anything right then. Our flight response initiated. We ran and ran and ran until the shrieks grew distant. Then we reached the village. We couldn't believe we had escaped. Crying loudly, we banged on the doors and screamed for help, our parents opening the door. What happened? My father said. Has someone tried to kidnap you? My mother asked. I was so scared, my children. Please say something, my father said. And all we did was cry until they took us and left the village immediately. I don't recall what happened later that night, but when I woke up, I was in a hospital. My left foot was strapped and tied at a distance above my bed, my brother at my side still unconscious. Was it all a nightmare? After three days, we were discharged from the hospital. We explained everything to our parents, and they actually believed us. Imran's body was recovered somewhere outside the caves with an empty skull and an intact body. That poor soul. Upon receiving this news, Imran's mother became mentally unstable. A family had been destroyed. Though the news called it an animal attack, my younger brother and I knew exactly what had happened that day. With some research, I discovered that the creature was an ancient princess who was possessed by demons. Her father tried to exorcise her, but she managed to escape and took refuge in those caves. It is said that she awakens before the 14th of every lunar month and then hibernates again before luring people in, specifically children. It consumes their fearful thoughts. It is said that she can only lure in children if they are alone. Those who survive continue to experience bad luck or an unnatural death. The fear grew wider with the mysterious disappearances of a lot of children back in the 1900s. The parents wouldn't even allow kids to go outside alone after dark. Soon after all of this, our father took us to a local exorcist and we were given two talismans. He told us to never, ever take them off. Now, even years later, we feel watched while we sleep. We wonder what will happen if we take off our talisman. Will it hunt us down? My brother makes sure that our doors are always locked and we keep knives under our pillows just before going to bed just in case we see it again. Wow. That is a wild story. It is wild. Towards the end, when they were talking about the animal attack, I had the, this weirdest flash where, um, you know, like, well, I'll... <laughs> with Sorry. All, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll like the, uh, the... Do you want my water? Oh, no, I yeah. just didn't know it was near oh, the okay. end. I have lemons in it. I couldn't see the bottom. Ah. Uh, with, like, like these tales of, like, cryptid type things. Mm-hmm. It made me think of, like, a zoo. Like, what if they actually somehow, oh someday, God. definitively... Because, I mean, obviously, it's um, there's going to be a lot of skepticism around these things just because, like, why haven't we found these creatures? But there are mm-hmm. so many stories. And, like, what if they actually captured one of these things, like this cave monster, and then just had it, like, in a zoo somewhere? How mind-blowing that would be. Oh, my God. Like, if it couldn't... Uh, if it didn't have the ability to... Uh, go through walls and stuff, right? If it could actually just be like trapped in some right, right. giant plexiglass type zoo box thing. Oh my God, that'd be the craziest zoo, the, the coolest zoo ever in a sense if there was like a cryptid zoo. Oh my God. Actually, <laughs> yes. Most popular attraction in the world. Because you would know that it was, and I love that you would know it's real, but mm-hmm. also it's stuck in there. Mm-hmm. Like, like a weird monster zoo where it's like you're safe. I mean, there would be like uh, a haunted what? house that you go to in the light of day. Right, right. Most popular one in the history of <laughs> any attraction, basically. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah, what a, I mean. I, I, I know. I know it's, it's a, like a little bit tricky to kind of follow a little bit with like some language differences. Right, but, but I got it. Like, you know, just like this, there's this, I mean, essentially a fucking monster in mm-hmm. this cave system that mm-hmm. eats children. Uh-huh. And then if you actually saw that, how traumatic, like, and insane that would be. I feel like it's so crazy that. I, I well a few things. I think it's interesting, like the bad dream, sort of mm-hmm. like a premonition. Mm-hmm. But I can understand how, you know, he's thinking like, oh my god, it just must be stuck in a dream again. It must be stuck, in, you know, something terrible. Right. To wake up in a hospital, and I was picturing him the way he's talking about, like, you know, how sometimes they have to suspend your legs yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. avoid blood clots. I was like, oh my god, to wake up in a hospital as a child when you think that you're just going to wake mm-hmm. up from a dream, kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. like. To have that, and then his brother is still, and then there, this child is mm-hmm. has been murdered, killed, uh, eaten. I don't know what word to use there. Right. What? And uh, I like I like that that story had like a different flavor to it, just because it was set in a different place mm-hmm. and and told by someone of a different culture. Where like yeah, like uh, the talismans, and mm-hmm. you know, like like being given that to ward off you know evil spirits and protection mm-hmm. and the folklore behind uh-huh. uh, what this monster may be. 
Yeah, I just love I love the variety of that one. Yeah, I love um, on like a more positive note. Mm -hmm. I love uh, cultural differences like, yeah, we just went to this cave city and Mm -hmm. we just knocked on some random stranger's door. Mm -hmm. Like the hospitality of it. Oh, guests are blessings, you know, like come in and, you know, let us show you our gardens. Let us feed you. Yeah, that's what. Right. Oh, God, we were talking to somebody a, a while back, uh, actually while on vacation, about somebody being somewhere else. They're like, like, uh, and they were talking about some really hospitable place. Oh, um, it was somewhere in the Middle East, and they were talking about tea and about how, like, you're not supposed to refuse the tea. Actually, I think it was somebody who might have stopped by here at the uh, Suck Dungeon and oh. just, like, said, I like, think you're, like, a veteran. Mm-hmm. And they're over there. But it was something about, like, it was so rude to say no to it, and they were so hospitable, but like people, they would take you into their homes, yeah, and they would insist to feed you, yeah, and the tea, and, and like this person was basically saying, like after a while, you're like, that's so nice, but I'm so full, <laughs> and I'm so tired of tea, and I have to pee every 15 minutes, <laughs> like please be less nice. Oh my gosh! But but I loved like you know I love here, that, it, it reminded me of that you know where in there in that culture like so hospitable, and that mm-hmm. is such a cool thing because that's not how it is here like no. you know, we're friendly and very yeah. friendly and but we so wouldn't just welcome gonna... strangers nope. into our home that's not an american thing we do not no. just welcome strangers into our homes um, but some countries do that's yeah. so yeah it's very yeah. cool okay speaking of that so this is kind of on topic kind of off mm-hmm. so we have like the next door app well i have it i don't think you follow don't it, don't it just like kind of yeah. tells you what's happening in your neighborhood or whatever well yesterday one mm-hmm. of these things that popped up it was like hey um there's a, a white van zipping around the neighborhood with a young girl that keeps jumping out. What? And, like, like she's, you know, like they're pulling yeah. over. She's jumping out. She's coming to the front door. She's knocking. She's trying to like offer to like clean, oh. clean your doorway, clean this. Like, but weird. Like they mm-hmm. said that she's got like this very small dish and she's like, can I clean your doorway? And uh, my what? brain, I'm such, I'm so terrible. I'm like, oh my God, it's black eyed children. Oh my God, they're here. <laughs> they're here. They're here. Because there's been a lot of like weird instances of that recently in in our area where you know what i i didn't know this was weird and it wasn't enough for me to question him but it was no i'm not making this up okay this is not one of my things literally last night i was here not joking here at the studio late uh i came home not crazy late yeah but like past dark what like 9 9 30 yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere around there uh to like just do some stuff at home and there was somebody in the parking lot i had never seen before and it was like uh either a van or a big suv and it was a dude and he was the back door was open and he was talking to somebody in the back seat, but it was too dark for me to see in. And it was just a weird vibe when I walked up and they were parked right next to my truck. So like I did the re- remote click as I walked out to like, hey, I'm coming over there. Yeah. And then he just kind of like turned, you know, probably a guy like middle aged, I don't know, 50 ish. What? And, yep. And he was just like, oh, hey, man. And then he like uh, turned back and talked to somebody that I couldn't see. It was just a weird vibe. And I had this flash of like, is someone trapped in that car? But I mean. All I had was a weird vibe. I couldn't, I, it, it would have felt like inappropriate to walk over and be like, hey, I, I don't, I, I can't see anyone being hurt. I can't see, you, there's not even a threatening tone that you're using, but I find you creepy and I want to examine your vehicle. Can I tell you that in instances like that, you yeah. should immediately memorize the license plate. Uh, and then as soon as you get in your car, right? I don't even know who I'd report or um, what I'd report. Write it down. Yeah. And then you can like, you know, the next day you can just call the non-emergency number and be like, listen, you, this is, yeah. I'm telling you, this is very important because your gut. But I never saw anyone that else. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Your gut instincts are stronger than you know. Yeah. You, for all you know, there is that van with that license plate is missing. You don't know. The cops are like, might they, mm-hmm. uh, somebody mm-hmm. might be missing. There might be vandalism taking place or they, they have a partial. You're, I mean, you're not going to call yeah. the cops every day. Okay. Don't be a lunatic. <laughs> like, cause there yeah, are those yeah, people yeah. who are constantly, but you're calling a non-emergency line and you're yeah. like, Hey, listen, this, this is, where is I, weird. And yeah. you know why else it's important is that you also need to tell the person who owns our building. Cause it's like, Hey, cause are, are there cameras mm-hmm. out there? I mean, there are women that work in this building that might walk out there by themselves. Mm-hmm. It is good for everyone to know like, Hey, you know you should be careful, mm-hmm. but I think because of where we live, it's so small and still yeah. in a way kind of quaint, but there's such an influx. There's way more people moving here. Yeah. You you forget that like it is not the area that you grew up in 20 years ago. I didn't live here 20 years ago, but yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, this saying. is not small town so much anymore. Yeah. And you can't take that for granted. Yeah. I hear all that. But what just kick the shit out of him or that you walked out there and just like, he's like, hey, what's that? And just punch him in the face. Better safe than sorry. That's right. You could. I mean, right. we, we do have like a machete in our office. You could just come out like wielding mm-hmm. your sword. And then when I find out that it was just his wife in the backseat and she was just like waking up from a nap, then I'm like, sorry, but you seemed kind of creepy. I mean, I, what was I supposed to do? It is weird in the sense that, like, you've chosen a very random parking lot. That's what I don't like because it's I like know. you can but sleep. But it's not far off the freeway. Uh-huh. 
He wasn't dressed like he just woke up. I don't know. It just was weird. Yeah. Well, trust your gut. Yeah. You can sleep in a Walmart parking lot. You can park an RV in a, in a Walmart parking lot. Like people who travel across They still the allow that? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So it's like, you know, why why would you choose here? Mm-hmm. True. I don't like it. Our yeah. parking lot is pr- fairly well lit, though. So at least yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah. feel... I don't know. But yeah, there, there have been just like recently, like a lot of like, hey... Like a lot of uh, like door to door salesmen recently. I'm mm-hmm. like, what? That's still a thing, and I don't believe that it's still a thing. I think there some was some kind of scam. Yeah, there was an incident like two weeks ago, where it was like a couple teenagers knocking on doors in a neighborhood trying to like sell something, and uh, this woman posted on there. She's a little bit el- elderly, and she was like, I was so terrified. Yada, yada. It was all fine. Like a couple days later, it turned out I was like, hey, sorry, it's like my asshole kids. They were. <laughs> they were doing like some like w- dare night. Like you had to like do oh. it. You know? But it's like I. That is terrifying. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful we have a fence in front of our house. That is enough (laughs) to deter people. You want to to thank some Annabelles? I do. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. I'd love to. I would like to thank the following Annabelles. Natalie uh, Natalie Elledge, Sarah Ebsworth, Joe Nichols, Anna Henderson, Regina Default, Kelsey Hammer, Tawny Johnson, Laura Jean Papa, James Harrington, Mitchell Bueller, Alex Teitzel, Jesse Clifton, Ashley Palmer, Drew Boyer, Fidel Hernandez, Troy Bloyd, Troy Bloyd, Bloyd, Mark Lee, another Troy, no last name, Cameron, Cameron Kellum, Katrina Whittier, Anna Martinez, Sydney White, Hillary Grant, Tanisha Sims, Kelsey Walker, Mackenzie, no last name. When you read the name Bueller in a list, I, I, know. I immediately have to make the pop culture reference of Bueller. Do, and Bueller. Do you think Mitchell hasn't heard that 1,000 times? Bueller. Yeah, probably 1,000 times. And he's probably like, gee, thanks. Again? <laughs> We're in the list like that. I mean, come on. Uh, I want to thank the following Annabelle's Nikki Moreno, Amanda Patterson, Zach Tranka, Nana Kofod, Dan Geiger, Lexi Wrights, Kayla Om, Stephanie Barney, Kayla uh, Mezzarelli, or wait, Meser, Meserly, Meserly, Kayla Meserly, Jennifer Seuss, Auntie Jen, Victor Martinez, um, Janessa Addison, Gregor Meister. This is all like one word. I feel like I that's know. a username. <laughs> Yasinia Gonzalez, uh, Ilana Romney, or Ilana Rami, Courtney Stoker, Carrie Hill, Shasta Bobasta, probably not a birth name, J- Shasta Bobasta. Welcome to the world, eight pound baby Shasta Bobasta. That would be so amazing. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jason Goss, Joe Druniak, Dylan, Sonny, Darren Johnson, Rusty J, um, Courtney Birchfield. And, nice. and do you have any spoopy shout outs? I do. To Ender Lincoln from your mom, Jessica, I love you. To Ian from Sam, happy birthday. To Jensen from Stephen. Stephen or Stefan? I'm going to say Stefan because it's a PH. To Jensen from Stefan, happy eight year anniversary. This is great. To KC from KC. It's like two friends, same name. Happy belated birthday. To Sammy from James. So proud of you for chasing your dreams. And to Rita Riggs from your friend. Happy B Day. Happy B Day. Happy B Day. Happy B Day. Shasta Bobasta. <laughs> Uh, that's our show this that's week. That's not Shasta Bobasta's birthday. <laughs> Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith on social media and for the badmagicmerch.com design. Store at badmagicproductions.com for customer service. Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. And Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Thank you to Sarah Finch for finding the first story. And to Sophie Evans for finding the second. If you don't want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, if you want to help donate to our charities and more, please check out our Patreon. And enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee. Through time and space, evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. 